Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. A shocking revelation in the murder murder mystery. Are you innocent of everything? I'm innocent. If I have shot him, he didn't be dead. He's alive. This, just hours before Alec Murdoch is arrested for the second time. And the federal trial of Elizabeth Holmes. How prominent reporters are fighting back to maintain their coverage of the case. Plus, we're just days away from jury selection in the trial of Ahmaud Arbery's murder. We take a look back at the case so far, and later, a shocking connection in the disappearance of Kathy Durst. It's Bob. I jumped up, I ran out. The ex-husband of First Lady Jill Biden says he once had an affair with Robert Durst's first wife. Law & Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Another set of twists and turns in the Murdoch murder mystery out of South Carolina. An alleged suicide for hire hitman says Alec Murdoch was never shot in the head. All this just hours before Murdoch is arrested for the second time. Murdoch was taken into custody on Thursday on two counts of obtaining property by false pretenses. The charges stem from misappropriated settlement funds in the death of Murdoch family housekeeper Gloria Statterfield. Satterfield died mysteriously on the family property in 2018. An autopsy was never performed. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division says Murdoch was taken into custody upon his release from an Orlando drug rehab center. He is being held at the Orange County Corrections Department until he is extradited to his home state of South Carolina. Murdoch, a once prominent attorney, has led investigators along a string of mysterious deaths and incidents over the past year. In June, Murdoch's wife and son were found murdered on family property. Murdoch has been since named a person of interest in that case. Three months after their deaths, Murdoch reported he was shot in the head while changing a flat tire. Murdoch later revealed he had an opioid drug addiction and had hired 61-year-old Curtis Eddie Smith to shoot and kill him. Murdoch claimed he staged the failed suicide by hire scheme so his remaining son could benefit from a life insurance policy. In an exclusive interview with the Today Show, Smith claims Murdoch set him up and that Murdoch himself was never shot in the head. He's standing like this. He said, you gonna shoot me? I said, no. He said, well, you just got to do it. And he, he made his move like, like this, you know? And I just grabbed his arm. You, you took the gun. I shoved it up behind him, between me and him. And it went off. The gun went off. Did it hit him? Did the bullet no. hit him? No. So that I, that that story there's where no he got no blood on me, there's no blood on him. He didn't get shot in the head. No. Did your client ever sell drugs to Alec Murdoch? No, absolutely not. Everybody's met my client now. You just saw him on TV. I've never had a client in 13 years represent people break down and cry after some sort of issue like this. And you mentioned the insurance scheme, but uh, Mr. Murdoch's attorneys yesterday yesterday came out and said, no, 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 Mr. Smith didn't know about the insurance scheme beforehand. No, no, he just showed up and obliged to shoot him. So apparently the conspiracy to commit insurance fraud should be dismissed today. Joining us today is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Katie, so now the hitman was set up. Do you believe him? And what could this mean for Murdoch? It's really tough, Brian, because this was a very detailed account of a very convoluted incident. And with things like this, we always want to look to the forensics. The forensics will be able to tell conclusory whether or not he's telling the truth. And the risk with coming out publicly like this is you can't walk it back. He's already made his case to the public, and that's going to be binding. All right, Terry, with all of these arrests and, and now an extradition back to South Carolina, what do you think the penalties will look like for Murdoch for his legal license, his liberty, and his life? You know, Murdoch could face years, if not life, in prison. We already know it's a huge fall from grace. He was a respected attorney. His family had a good reputation. But now he's facing charges for misappropriation of these settlement funds. He's facing charges for insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit suicide. And don't forget, obviously, the fact that his wife and son have been killed. And if he is indicted and faces charges for that, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. You know, a lot of twists and turns that we said in this murder mystery, and we'll take you down each turn as we see them. Thank you both. In other top legal news, the FBI returns to the swamp area near Northport, Florida, in the search for Brian Laundrie. 
Laundry was the fiance of Gabby Petito, who went missing in August. Petito's remains were found in Wyoming last month. The coroner says she was strangled to death. Laundry has been missing from his parents' home in Florida since at least September 13th. The 24,000-acre reserve has been searched a number of times for laundry. A human remains detection dog is searching the area to detect the presence of a body or the lack of one in the swamp. Laundry faces a federal charge related to the misuse of Petito's debit card and has been named a person of interest in her death. And just months after his release from prison, comedian Bill Cosby is served with another lawsuit. Lily Bernard says Cosby drugged and raped her in August of 1990. According to the lawsuit, Cosby coerced Bernard to travel from New York City to Atlantic City, where the alleged rape happened. The lawsuit says Cosby became a mentor to Bernard and an aspiring actress, even offering to feature her on The Cosby Show. In July, Cosby was released from prison when Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his criminal sexual assault case. The 84-year-old served more than two years of his sentence. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, looking ahead to jury selection in the trial of Ahmaud Arbery's murder. But first, reporters fighting to cover the case in the federal trial of Elizabeth Holmes. We break down the motions two prominent journalists filed in relation to the case. All that and more after the break. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmad Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. The three men charged will now stand trial. For live gavel gavel coverage of the trial, subscribe to Law & Crime on YouTube TV today. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily as the federal trial of Elizabeth Holmes stretches into week six. Prominent journalists file a motion of their own in regards to covering the trial. As we've reported on Law & Crime Daily, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter John Carreyrou filed a motion to be exempt from witness exclusion after Holmes' defense team added him to the witness list. In 2015, Carreyrou broke the Theranos fraud story that would be the catalyst for Holmes' charges. Earlier this month, Carreyrou's attorney said adding the reporter to Holmes' witness list was just a ruse so that he could not cover the trial. On Thursday, Carreyrou addressed the court asking to keep in mind his First Amendment rights as a journalist, saying an exclusion order, meaning a witness cannot be in the courtroom for other witness testimony, or gag order, meaning a witness cannot discuss their testimony, should not apply to Carreyrou. Fellow reporter Roger Parloff filed a similar motion in an effort to maintain confidentiality in his reporter notes and recordings. Holmes, the former CEO of Theranos, claimed the company would revolutionize blood testing. She now faces 12 fraud charges in federal court. Back to break down the latest in the Theranos trial is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Terry, what's Kerry Roo's strongest argument, and is it a winning one? Well, I think his strongest argument is the First Amendment, and I do think it's a winning one. Freedom of the speech and freedom of the press are the two major arguments in the First Amendment. And freedom of the press really means he has the right to gather information, he has the right to disseminate that information, and he has the right to keep that information confidential. Now, courts have in the past made journalists disclose information, and they can subject them to fines and penalties. You might recall Judith Miller for The New York Times she was actually held in jail because she refused to disclose her source. Here, though, I don't think there's any sort of security interest or a compelling argument that the court would win. So I do think that he's going to win a First Amendment argument. I think he will defeat that gag order, and I think that he'll be able to go into the court and be able to listen to the other witnesses at the end of the day. Now, Katie, winning an argument is half the battle. How do you think the judge will apply it? Do you think the judge will split the baby, so to speak, and allow both reporters there for some of the testimony, but not all? Or do you think it's all or nothing from here? Brian, I'm usually a big fan of split the baby, but there's some things you can't negotiate that way. And being a witness and then sitting in for others' witness testimony is problematic. I think what the judge should first do is a showing to see whether or not he would actually be a fact witness. And then if there's some evidentiary finding, then maybe preclude him from sitting in. But if there's no reason and it is all a ruse, then absolutely, I believe, I totally agree with Terry, he should be there. Yeah, I think the fact-based hearing would be the interesting part. Uh, 
I, I think it's pretty petty of the defense attorneys. I'm just going to throw it out there. I think it's a bit of a ruse. I don't see a reason for him to testify. And what's the harm from having him report the case? Uh, I would love to see a fact-based hearing here and see how that plays out. I think that's definitely the move here. Thank you both. A lot of podcasts focus on true crime stories. Now, there's a new podcast that looks specifically at the forensics of those cases. Angela Levy spoke with Joseph Scott Morgan about his new podcast, Body Bags. For 20 years, Joseph Scott Morgan worked as a forensic death investigator. He also teaches about forensics at Jacksonville State University. And now he's taking his expertise into the world of podcasting. He has a new podcast out. It's called Body Bags. Joseph, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, what prompted you to do this podcast? I felt as though that there's a grand void in the podcast world relative to forensics. And yes, I have been a death investigator and a forensic scientist, but you know, I've spent the better part of two decades now as an educator. There's such a, a diminishment of information and kind of how you kind of drill down into what the facts are as opposed to you know, uh, a lot of the drama that surrounds things. You know, let's talk about the science because the science is, is equally compelling and exciting. Now, I listened to the first episode and it really takes a deep dive into the forensics. And in that first episode, you talk about the Gabby Petito case and really uh, apply your expertise to explain to the listeners what's going on. You're learning within the morgue to kind of read what the dead are leaving behind. I know that's horribly cliche, but you know, we always say, you know, we speak for those that can no longer speak for themselves. And it's the science, not us speaking, but it's us interpreting the science that's left behind by the dead and the life that was lived. And so I think that that's, that's something that people want to know about. The Gabby, Gabby Petito case is, is a fine example uh, because uh, we don't have any information. I mean, we, we really don't. I mean, other than the fact, you know, that the most glaring thing is that those forensic scientists, the coroner, the forensic pathologists, they shot out of that door on that Tuesday afternoon and they proclaimed that the manner of death was specifically a homicide. Well, it's a really interesting podcast and I'm sure our viewers and listeners uh, will enjoy it too. So Joseph Scott Morgan, thanks for joining us today to talk about body bags. And we'll send it back to you in the studio. Thanks, Angela. As a friend and colleague of JSM and a homicide public defender who learns so much just from hearing him speak, I can't say enough. Definitely check out Body Bags. And coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a startling connection to the disappearance of Kathy Durst. How First Lady Jill Biden's past intertwines with the unsolved murder. Plus, examining events leading up to the trial of Ahmaud Arbery's accused murders. We break down the case so far after the break. Welcome back. As we look ahead to next week's trial for the death of Ahmaud Arbery, we're taking a closer look into the charges against now former district attorney Jackie Johnson. Johnson was the top prosecutor in Glynn County, Georgia, at the time of the shooting. She previously worked directly with the defendant Gregory McMichaels while he was an investigator for the Brunswick Judicial Circuit District Attorney's Office. Though the incident happened in late February 2020, no arrests were made until May, when the video of the shooting was leaked. On the day of the shooting, Johnson is accused of preventing two police officers from exercising their duties. According to the indictment, Johnson violated her oath by, quote, showing favor and affection to Gregory McMichael during the investigation. Johnson was voted out of her role in November 2020 and was later charged in September 2021 with obstructing a police officer and violating her oath of office. She faces a felony charge for violating her oath of office that carries a one to five year prison sentence, whereas the charge for obstructing a police officer carries up to 12 months. On the day of the shooting, Gregory McMichaels called Johnson and left this voicemail. Jackie, this is Greg. Did you call me as soon as you possibly can? Um, we're, um, my son and I have been involved in the shooting and uh, I need some advice right away. Please call me. Here to break down Jackie Johnson's involvement in the death of Ahmaud Arbery is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, consciousness of guilt is a huge part of cases, as, a, as you know. Does calling a head prosecutor after a shooting show Gregory Michael believe he may have been in hot water, even if he thought he was doing a citizen's arrest? 
You know, there's no question about it, Brian. It is consciousness of guilt here as far as McMichael is concerned. First of all, the prosecutor is his former boss, and he's the defendant, and he should not be calling the prosecutor for advice. So clearly, he should go through his attorney. And that's just a minor point. The bigger point is, was he trying to influence or obstruct justice here? Was he trying to, in any way, shape the investigation? And I think an argument can be made that he was trying to do exactly that, which is why he made that phone call and he left the message on the recording. So I think it shows real consciousness of guilt. And I think if that comes in, that the jury is going to believe the same exact thing. Now, Katie, if someone was defending this case, I can see the argument being that the pastor's attorneys decided not to prosecute the McMichaels. And this, arguably, is a political prosecution. But with one of the former DAs being prosecuted, does that change things? You know, Brian, it really complicates the whole analysis because, for one, double jeopardy doesn't attach. So it's not like there's something binding because the prosecution was declined. But the part that gets complicated is whether or not they declined to prosecute based upon a real analysis of the evidence or whether this was a rogue prosecutor acting in a personal way. And if that's the case, then the DA's office can distance themselves from that decision and have another shot at him. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And of course, it's going to mirror what happens to the criminal prosecution. Yeah, we'll see how the defense brings up this issue. I'm sure the prosecution will dive right into it in the case of the death for Ahmaud Arbery. When we come back, the unsolved disappearance of Kathy Durst now includes a link from the First Lady's past. Could Joe Biden's ex-husband be the missing piece in the unsolved case? Hear Bill Stevens' side of the story after this. Welcome back. Real estate heir Robert Durst is sentenced after he's found guilty for murder. Durst's guilty verdict came last month after the lengthy trial for the 2000 murder of Durst's best friend, Susan Berman. Prosecutors say his motive was that Berman had information about his missing wife, Kathy. They allege he murdered Kathy in New York back in 1982, and that Berman was going to come forward with information on that case. More than 40 years after Kathy Durst's disappearance, her body was not been found. She is legally declared dead in 2017. Durst spent three weeks on the stand testifying in his own defense. After just three days and only seven and a half hours, the jury reached a guilty verdict of murder with the special circumstances of killing a potential witness and lying in wait. Sentencing was set for Thursday. As Durst's sentencing for the murder of Susan Berman is doled out, the 78-year-old could face even more charges out of New York in connection to the disappearance and death of his wife, Kathy McCormick Durst. The Westchester County DA's office is reportedly convening a grand jury, and prosecutors already named a star witness. Bill Stevenson, the ex-husband of First Lady Jill Biden, claims to have a long history with Kathy McCormick Durst. Stevenson says the two had been lifelong friends before things turned romantic. He says the two were having an affair the same year that she disappeared. In an exclusive interview with News 12 Westchester, Stevenson says he witnessed Robert Durst make violent threats towards Kathy Durst. He says she disappeared just one week later. As News 12 Westchester reports, Stevenson was approached by New York State investigators about the relationship. The next thing I realize, we hear pounding on the door. It's like 7.30 in the morning. She runs out of the bedroom and uh, she runs back in and she says, it's, it's Bob. I jumped up, I ran out. And then all of a sudden he screams something, but he goes like this. He had a wad of like cash rolled up and hit her right in the face with it. Katie, this sentencing has been a long time coming. How long do you expect Durst to be sentenced? And do you think his age or health will help reduce that number? You know, Brian, Durst has had a lot of lucky breaks over time. He's gotten very lenient sentences in previous instances, and I don't think that that's going to happen here. He has tried at every turn to really lessen the blow of the severe finding. And I don't think it's going to happen now, especially with the looming threats he has. So I project that the judge is going to throw the book at him. Yeah, I can see that as well. Terry, how do you see the new developments in the murder for Kathy Durst playing out? Could we see an indictment in that soon? 
you know, we really could see an indictment in Westchester County in New York here. I think the fact that they have convened a grand jury, they have this new star witness, Bill Stevenson, who is talking about the fact that he saw Durst, and Durst was violent as it related to Kathy. And he said he had an affair, so he was very close with Kathy Durst. And I think that if he is to testify in front of that grand jury, we could have an indictment, and we really could see Durst potentially having another trial. I think, though, I agree with Katie, I think he is going to probably get a sentence of, you know, life without parole. So the real question is, uh, you know, is he going to get that sentence in California? Now, Terry, did I hear you right, that you think that Kathy, uh, that uh, Robert Durst may potentially have another trial? I'm not disagreeing that he gets indicted. My question is, do you think he'll live long enough to see a second trial? You know, it's interesting. We saw him during the trial and how he gradually got weaker and weaker. He had, you know, a bag that he had to carry with him. He had to, at one point, go to the hospital and he couldn't come to the courtroom. So we know he has multiple illnesses, so many that he had to list them off and he actually joked about, did he include everything? So there's a real possibility that he won't live long enough to face another trial in Westchester County. Yeah, and maybe John Lewin will wave into New York to prosecute the case as well, but we'll see. Thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.